Welcome to the latest in our series of ENO Center for Transportation webinars. ENO is an independent, nonpartisan, and nonprofit think tank that has shaped up public debate on critical multimodal transportation issues and built an innovative network of transportation professionals for 100 years. I'm Marjorie Dickman, a proud ENO board member and Chief Government Affairs and Public Policy Officer at BlackBerry, where I oversee our global government relations and technical standards operation. I am thrilled to be joined today by four powerhouse women leaders in the transportation C-suite for this Women at the Helm webinar. On the panel today, we have Global Transportation Chief Executive at AECOM, Jennifer Almond, who leads over 14,000 professionals in their global transportation design business. Also on our panel is the Chief Executive Officer of ACS Infrastructure Canada and ACS Infrastructure Development, Nuria Haltewanger. Nuria oversees the concession and P3 and operations of the ACS Group and leads her team in multi-billion dollar projects. I'd also like to welcome President of the U.S. Advisory Services at WSP, Denise Roth, who leads their consulting practice and formerly served as Administrator of the U.S. General Services Administration. Last but far from least, the Chief Executive Officer at CISTRA USA, Kimberly Slaughter, a transit leader and executive with more than 30 years shaping the transportation industry, leading complex multi-billion dollar projects and interdisciplinary teams. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes from Eno. First, we will have an exciting Q&A session with our panelists at the end. You can enter questions in the box on the side of your screen at any time, and we'll get to as many as possible. Second, while we don't expect to have any technical issues, Eno has found that simply exiting and rejoining the webinar tends to help any minor issues that may arise. And one note for me personally, in addition to women, we have hundreds of men signed up for today's webinar. This is fantastic. As women leaders, we all manage, mentor, and partner with many wonderful male colleagues. Understanding each other makes our teams and organizations stronger. With that, let's get started. Panelists, I'd love to hear more about your own leadership journeys. Can you tell us about a key turning point or decision point in your career? What led you there? And what did you learn from the experience? Uh, why don't we go a, uh, alphabetical order? Uh, so let's start with Jennifer and then Nuria, Denise, and then Kimberly. Sure. Hi, Marjorie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the call this afternoon. Pleasure to be um, always with my friends at Eno and really honored to serve on the board of the organization. If you're not involved in Eno, uh, make sure that you do uh, find a way to get involved, uh, driving policy discussions and playing an invaluable role in connecting transportation leaders across the, the country and the world. So I encourage you to get to get involved. Um, Marjorie, it's a, it's a question, you know, I get a lot and I always have kind of my go-to answer on this, this sort of, you know, crossroads kind of question. And I'm actually going to ditch my, my typical answer today because I've had just a, a new crossroads recently. I have, uh, I'm very pleased to have joined the ACOM team just about, I think, almost seven weeks ago now um, as our global chief for transportation. And after spending uh, the better part of my career really having an investor and developer hat in major public-private partnerships. Uh, and I have to tell you that the experience for me has been as someone who loved the transportation industry um, and who has played a certain role in, in these projects. This AECOM role for me was, some, was an opportunity to play a distinctly different role in the industry. And so, you know, what I found from that is what a, um, well, one, what an honor to join the AECOM team and the exciting projects that we're doing all over the world and thousands of colleagues that are, are leading in, in this space. But also just for me personally, to be at this point in my career where I've had some success, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed what I do, 
Um, but I took on something that was just a distinctly different perspective and a different different hat in our industry. And I have found it to be one of the most fulfilling things that I've done because you do get to a point where you think, this is what I do for a living, right? I work in transit or I work in highways or I'm on the private sector side or I'm on the public sector side or I'm a concessionaire investor or I'm a designer. And to be able to then shift in mid-career to look at an industry that you love and enjoy so much through a different lens um, has been a very fulfilling thing. So I think the advice that I would give is don't at any point in your career, um, early in your career, mid in, in your career, decades into your career, don't get too stuck on what you do for a living um, and challenge yourself to seek and to take opportunities um, to be able to put your experience to work in a role that's that's different than what you've done in the past. I think it's for me, I found it personally enriching. And from a, a, a manager, people leader perspective, as we're looking at our teams, when you're looking at candidates, so think out by the box, because when you take someone and put them in a different seat and they're looking through a different lens, uh, there's some magical things that can happen from that. So there's some lessons learned when we look at hiring as well. That, I couldn't agree more, Jennifer. Uh, Nuria. Well, I, I first of all, I want to thank Eno for organizing this panel, and I think it's an amazing topic, and I'm very grateful to be with such other esteemed women in the industry. So I wanted to thank you first off. Um, but I think I have to agree with Jennifer on you know, some of the lessons that I learned from, I would say there were two two key sort of points so far um, that were probably the biggest turning points in my career. And both of them were opportunities that sort of presented themselves that to be quite honest, I didn't think I was prepared for at the time when they came about. And so I thought, these people are crazy. Like, what are they, like, what? I don't, I don't know what, like, what? Um, and it was actually, you know, and there have now been studies that have shown that women tend to not put themselves forward for roles or don't consider themselves for roles unless they think they meet 100% of the criteria. Whereas, you know, they found that men typically will put themselves forward or at least, you know, make an attempt for a role, even if they meet, you know, 40 to 60% of the criteria. So, and that really was what happened with me. And the, the two sort of turning points or different aspects of my career were when I was asked to go in house. So I started my career, for those who don't know, um, as a lawyer. So my, my background, I had a finance background, and then I went to law school and um, I worked as an, as an attorney and I worked, you know, at a big law firm in New York. And it was when I was first approached by, you know, one of my main clients to go in house. And so that was the first turning point because I didn't really think I was, I wanted to go in house, but the role that they were offering was to be general counsel of, you know, this new company that they wanted to set up in, in North America. And, you know, I was a mid-level sort of slash senior associate. And I was like, I, you know, there's, I don't know. I, I don't know what I, if I'm ready to go to that type of, of level of a role. Um, and it ended up being an amazing opportunity because, you know, going from being an external consultant to going, you know, in, in-house and working at a developer entity, sort of, you know, getting to see from that perspective, even though I was doing so much of the consulting work already um, and the legal work already, there was a whole universe of things that I didn't even know existed. Um, and it was an incredible growth opportunity and to really get to understand some of the commercial considerations, um, even though I was in the legal role was, was pretty uh, remarkable. And then I would say the biggest transition was when um, I was offered the opportunity to take over the CEO role. And that was really um, a big jump because it was going now from not being in a legal role um, and an illegal support role to taking this, you know, taking the main commercial leadership role. And again, I thought, you know, what are, what? <laughs> like what, I, I, I didn't think I was, you know, I didn't think that I had had enough exposure to some of the things. And, and what I really learned and realized from it was, A, you know, if you're surrounded by people and you're working for people or with people who you trust and admire, if they're, if they're advocating for you to, to consider a role, it's because they see that you have the skills to do it. So even if you don't necessarily 
think that you meet all of the skills. They know that you have the judgment. And so if they're trusting you, you have to sort of put that trust in yourself as well. Because a lot of this, you know, having the imposter complex that some people get, I, you know, I had that for, I remember the first year, I was like, oh my gosh, everybody's going to realize I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then we ended up having one of our best years. So, you know, looking back, I was like, you know, I really, I had amazing support um, from the team itself. Um, and I had, you know, amazing support internally. And it was an opportunity that I don't know if it had been, I don't know that I would have applied if I hadn't been, you know, sort of pushed to take it. So my, my sort of advice is, you know, if you have a goal that you eventually want to reach, first start being vocal about sort of what your interests are and have faith that you're going to be able, you know, have faith in yourself and really put yourself forward. Um, so. That's 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 fantastic advice and also kudos to your company for uh recognizing the talent and um having the faith in you and I, like you said you had a tremendous year uh denise we'd love to hear from you yeah thank you so much marjorie and it is great to be here and i really do appreciate you know having this panel um, just as I was thinking about it, and, and maybe the context is obvious, but I think it's worth saying and reminding people that women make up 50% of the world's population, right? And so the things that we're building, those that we're serving, the ideas that we are creating, those are very much stimulated by women, either created by women or for women or something in between. Um, and so the, today's conversation is just even more important. I read another statistic recently that really just I, I keep coming back to, which is the fact that the majority of our young people under 17 years old are minorities. So our world is also changing in so many ways. And so to understand how these individuals will change and scope and shape our organizations and being prepared and, and understanding who they are and what matters is, is, is everyone's business. Um, so I really think that this conversation is so important today and can completely under, uh, identify with all that's been said so far. Um, you know, I um, have had the benefit of many firsts in my life in terms of either being the youngest or the first person of color or a woman. Um, and so I've, I've appreciated that role and really have tried to honor it over time. Um, and actually, I was city manager of uh, my adopted hometown, uh, which I was a, a role that I was really pleased to reach. I'd done a lot of work to get to that role um, when the president called and uh, offered me this, uh, ultimately, the role of leading the General Services Administration, which at the end of the day really fit for where my career had been. I've been focused on local government. I have been focused on state government and just how government interchange with the private sector to create better quality quality of life. Um, if anyone knows my story, you know that I grew up um, uh, rather poor in Washington, D.C. and Anacostia um, in a community that continues to be a key part of me. So being in a place where I could influence how we actually operated government and then made it better for other people was just the pinnacle for me. So saying, saying no to that job was not on the table at all, but it did mean uprooting my family. It meant the partnership with my husband having to change um, and all of those pieces that come between uh, with that. And the other part of it is also recognizing that I often didn't have the footsteps of others to walk in because of the fact that I was carving a new and different path. Um, and so in, in really since then, but I think it was leading up to that, that I really came to um, rest in the fact of appreciating my diversity the fact that I was going to be different in these roles. So what did that look like and what did that mean? And it meant that I could create a different uh, scenario in a different environment. Um, when I was uh, a city manager, uh, I was pregnant uh, when I came into the role and I was able to start talking about things differently from a C-suite level in terms of talking about family and talking about going to Little League and what that meant for people or understanding um, today what it means to take care and support an elderly parent. And, and so in these roles, I think we have the opportunity to really create it and carve it for what makes sense for us, but also for what your employees can identify with. And it's only when I have brought all of myself to a role that I've been most successful. 
that have been honest about, you know, these are my realities. I haven't done this before. I am the first to do this that looks like me or comes from my community. So how do I do that in a way that I identify with? And, and, and I really do encourage others to do the same. Um, you know, you never know that what you have the opportunity to create when you're willing to be that voice, that voice of difference. Um, so I, I've, I've been very fortunate. I continue to try to leverage that and, and learn from those uh, roles as I work with my staff even today at WSP. If there's anything that I wanted to um, really share with people is the ideas that have been stated so far in terms of trusting yourself um, and believing that that voice is the right voice. I had this uh, 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 I did a commencement speech at George Mason University, my alma mater, and I talked about the fact of, you know, as, as administrator of GSA, most of the agency leads are secretaries, but because it's a non-cabinet role, it's a, an administrator because it's sort of an independent agency. And so people would frequently say, oh, whose administrator are you? You know, there was just a general assumption that I was a you know, personal assistant for someone, but clearly not. Or when I, I say, no, it's the whole agency. Like, oh, so which region? I knew a regional administrator as well. You must have ran one of the regions. And, and so helping others really wrap their head around the difference of what the world can look like is also a little bit fun to that. So I would say really embrace who you are um, and, 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 uh, and being willing to share that. Um, other lessons that I've learned, and we will come back to some of these later, is also knowing when to stay in your ground. Because uh, that's something that women uh, will face oftentimes, especially in the boardroom, is knowing that difference of when is the time that you need to speak up and when is times that you need to be patient. And there are some qualities that we have as women uh, that is unique uh, or, or that we practice more than others, right? Negotiation skills and, and, and um, uh, collaboration skills, um, also patience. And uh, so we'll get back to that, some of those themes as well later. But I have uh, just been very fortunate in my career and if there's anything I try to do today, it's really trying to pass that on and create those opportunities for others. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you so much, Denise. And th there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of powerfulness inside all of those elements that you shared, um, and many of which, as you mentioned, we'll uh, touch on even more later. Uh, Kimberly. Yes, thank you. So uh, first of all, I did want to say to you how honored I am to be on the panel today. I was really on it when you reached out and invited me to be part of this discussion. Uh, I would have definitely watched it if I wasn't on the panel. So I get a great view from being on the panel as well. Uh, so thank you again. And, and you're gonna find, I think that we're all singing from the same hymnal here, you know, with very similar experiences. Um, I think the original question was, you know, what, uh, what, set the path for our career, you know, what, what, what was that game changer? And I, and I think one of the things I kind of heard in what Jennifer said, for me, it always seems like at right at the time I get to this great comfort zone in my career, where I'm feeling yeah. really comfortable and sure about what I'm doing. I bridged what Nuria said, where I thought, oh my God, these people are crazy. They, they think I could do this. Right. And, you know, some soon they're going to figure out, I don't know what I'm doing. But by the time you figure out what you're doing, it seems like that next opportunity comes along. And it's always something for me. It's been something that I go, gosh, yes, I'd love to do that. Right. You know, this is this is a next exploration for me. And, and my mission has always been from the beginning of uh, when I decided on my actually uh, degree plan in college and then graduate school was I wanted to do something that made a difference. I wanted to, when I leave this earth, I want to have made a difference and did something to make people's lives better. Now, originally I thought that was gonna be through designing communities with housing and uh, you know affordable housing for people and, and that kind of thing. But then I got introduced to transportation and uh, 34 years ago, and you know, and I, and then transportation really gave me a focus on transit, and I became very aware of how transit truly transforms people's lives. Right? You know, that whole access to um, education, to better housing stock, to uh, entertainment, you know, medical care, etc. That is powerful in people's lives. 
and having access to that not only through automobiles but through the access to public transportation is key to the sustainability of our civilization bottom line and so and i wanted to be a part of that and i i wanted to figure out how could i help make the decisions and have more influence and it's almost like at every juncture in my life you know i'd get comfortable and then realize well, well, you know, I thought the decision was made here, but it's not really that decision is being made at this other level, you know, and so you keep looking for that opportunity to truly have influence, make a difference. And it goes to some of the things that all the other panelists have said. I think that I have a responsibility as a woman. I have a responsibility as a woman of color, you know, and to to represent voices at the table that don't normally get seats at the table. And when we're developing service, when we're developing infrastructure, when we're making decisions about funding, uh, when we're developing policy, those voices need to be heard so that everyone in our in our country feels included or feels served by the things we do. You know, it was funny because growing up at the time, I don't know that I really realized what influence it would have, but my mother would always say it was that it's so important for women to be in the workforce. Uh, and, and, and now mind you, this was a woman that most of my life growing up, she worked part-time and then, you know, most of the time she may have been a full-time mom, but she thought it was, she was college educated, but she thought it was extremely important for women to be in the workforce. And she would items in the church and say, this had to be designed by a woman. Look at what it's, look at the problem it's, you know, and have this conversation with you and reinforce to me the value that women bring to the workforce. And and you see that hap has happened over time. Um, and 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 it, so it makes me really excited to be, if nothing else, um, a role model for other women to get into the professions and to get into the workforce, stay into the work, stay in the workforce. I know everyone doesn't have that option necessarily, doesn't make that decision, and that's okay. And I think we shouldn't beat up on people for not deciding to be in the workforce, right? But it's about having that diversity of voice at the table, and I'm really happy that I can be part of that. Um, I think the similarly to Jennifer, I just started my CEO role with Sister USA on February 1st, which also was the first day of Black History Month, which became a really powerful start date, right, in the in the community about me starting on, on Black History Month. And, and I really hadn't realized the significance of that until it was happening. I'm really glad to be a part of that because I am the first female CEO in Sistra um, worldwide, right? The, I have, 12 counterparts around the world and i am the first and only female and then i'm a female of color so uh i am very very happy to set that example and show uh that a woman can lead an organization and be and make a difference to the company and it's funny because uh, what's also been highlighted to me is that being a female in this role is uh, also a, a big deal in France right now. Our overall parent company is headquartered in Paris, France. And so I am speaking to, through the sister, uh, to, I believe it's next week actually, uh, because uh, people in France are really excited about having a woman in this role. And, and I am looking forward to the things that I can do, the things that, the way I can influence and grow the company. And it, one of the most powerful things I think that I bring to the table is a different vision. It's a vision of inclusion. It's a, a vision of growth. You know, it's a vision of possibility. And and I hope that vision is infectious. I, I can only imagine that it, that it is. And I know you and you are a role model uh, for many women and you are making a difference. Thank so you. all that I can say is, you know, all four of our panelists, you know, Thank you for sharing your personal stories. Um, I can certainly relate, and I'm sure that many in our audience can as well. So as we look more broadly at the transportation industry, as many, uh, as many of you mentioned, will, women still remain very underrepresented in the C-suite. What can industry do to help create more opportunities 
for talented women to advance into these key leadership roles? What about women of color and diversity? How can organizations be intentional, intentional about increasing representation of women in the C-suite and that these opportunities include women of color? Panelists, feel free to jump in. Well, I, may, I may start, Marjorie. I suspect there's some really good suggestions around the panel, but I, I may start with the probably the, the most basic or fundamental one from, from my perspective, and that's starting um, at the, the very entry part of the career all the way through to build that pipeline to ultimately feed the C-suite. And, you know, in my experience, the, the key to success in, in doing that is about data. If you run a business or you run an organization, um, that you get data on your desk every day um, that reflects the things that you care about as a leader and the things that your organization values. Um, and so if you have something on your desk that has revenue or your equity IRR or your safety stat or that that shows that your safety performance your that, that's what you care about if you're looking at that dashboard and that does not include diversity um, then then you are not putting the full weight of the leadership of the organization be, behind that it's very critical to have the data to measure success and to actually align executive and people manager performance to that success. We do that in every other aspect of our business where we wanna drive performance. So this is not the soft stuff, this is the hard stuff. This is the stuff that makes us competitive um, and it should be at the top of our list in terms of the performance metrics that we use to measure our success uh, and to reward our, 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 um, our people leaders. And so making sure you have that data and the executives are, are measured uh, and rewarded or not based on that success is a key, I think, fundamental um, to this, to, to uh, making progress in this area. It's a great answer. In, if I could just build on that, because I really like that point, uh, Jennifer, and I think it's also how do you take that forward into your programs? Um, something I'm really proud of that's been launched at WSP uh, is called our gold program. And it's very bold and very simplistic, growing our leadership diversity. And the idea was specifically not to, obviously we had mentorship programs, but specifically sponsor individuals who are ready for that leadership step and need the exposure either for the other members of the C-suite to understand what that talent is, for that individual to have exposure to what does that meeting look like, that room that I'm not in, what's being discussed, how do I be a voice in that room? And sort of modeling and understanding what that looks like. Um, and, and oftentimes, some, some of the biggest risk is the uh, lack of willingness to take that risk. Some of the biggest uh, challenges for our CEOs and executive teams is being willing to take those risks. Um, and we recently had uh, some of our uh, organizational shifts that really tried to focus on our clients. And as we were doing that, we said, we want more diversity and we want to understand how do we bring more of that diversity into our leadership. And we wanted to be very intentional about it. And so I think being able to sort of understand what the data points are telling you and where the gaps are and then being intentional about filling those gaps is exactly where we need to be. As we look at the industry broadly, we need to be thinking about how are we encouraging women to go into fields such as engineering and transportation and what are we doing to graduate them right? So not only get them into the program, but get them out of the program and into particular roles. And then once they're in, to ensure that there is a pipeline and pathway that is defined, that they are clear, that there's transparency when there's opportunity for growth, that they're clear on what the steps are to get there, and that we are encouraging them. And then the final piece I would say to that, just for individuals themselves, is for them to raise their hands, right? So often we think, hey, if I'm doing a really good job, they'll notice and they're gonna call me up, right? Like my moment's coming. And yeah, sometimes it happens that way. More than often, you have to step forward and say, I am looking for this opportunity. I want to be better. I want that opportunity. Um, and, 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 and you ask enough, you get the chance as well. So I, I think it, it is a balance to that, um, but it really is rooted in understanding what is our data telling us about where our gaps are and how we're going to be intentional on in taking those steps. And um, it, it's something that I do think that we have to be very encouraging about. Um, and I apologize, but the last thing I'll say is just as we are thinking about our HR programs 
and how sometimes just the process of filling out paperwork can really sort of be a bias or unintentional bias against individuals, we have to look at that. Right, and think about having white labels and thinking about uh, what are the questions that people are being asked that may unintentionally keep them out of a process. Um, so a lot to unpack there, but I just, I really like that point about data because there's so much built out of it. Yeah, that, I was going to say that's a fantastic point. And by the way, one of the things we women do, uh, we apologize. There's no, <laughs> you know, we over apologize, and um, when you know, there's re there's really you know no need to, and um, uh, yeah, I I do it myself uh, all the time. Uh, but I think you've you've made some fantastic points there, and the gold program. I'd love to learn uh, more about that. Yeah. Uh, so other panelists, Kimberly, you want to yeah, go the ahead? Thing that I was. All right, thanks, Nuria. I was going to jump in and, and say my point was that we need to be intentional and purposeful. So I was going to build off of that point. And I think it does start from the beginning of the pipeline all the way through to, to the end. We need to be conscious of the fact that we need to go where diverse populations of people are and recruit from those places or start with the process of educating them that these job opportunities even exist ones that they may have never considered. And we need to go where they are to bring that message to them and bring them back to our household, to our companies, right? Uh, so it's about where we're recruiting uh, with colleges and universities, uh, organizations, right? There are a lot of great professional organizations out in, our, in the communities that uh, can be avenues for us to connect through, like Compto and WTS, even APTA, and you know, and other organizations, so that we can we can hit diverse pools of people and not just stay at, with the same places we've always been going and where everyone goes. Um, the thing I always say is that all of our A and E companies, in particular, you know, we all want to to fish at the top one to 5% of schools, right? And get that same upper echelon of students into our pipeline. But you know, if we broaden our view and cast our nets to further more places and, and, and decide that we don't always need the top one to 5% to be successful because sometimes talent is really hovering at around the 30% level, right? And some amazing talent that simply needs the opportunity to excel and needs the, the mentoring and addition, ongoing education. And, and we, and sometimes in conversations, we expect minority students to have more, or minority candidates to be more than we expect from mainstream candidates. So we need to broaden our perspective on who we're recruiting and who could do well with uh, the additional training that we can provide and that whether they need to be the end all be all right as they walk through the door in the first in the first place. I think we also need to, as we move up through mid management and executive level, we need to be purposeful about including diversity as a criteria when we're looking for candidates. It's not going to happen if we don't put that as a top priority because it's human nature. We have a tendency to bring in people that that we are comfortable with, that looks like us, that you know, hang in the same places with us. And if everyone in leadership are white males, guess what? We're getting more white males in. And I don't have a, I'm not trying to keep white males out of positions. I, I just want everybody to have an opportunity to compete for those, right? We just want to open our minds and open the opportunities to everyone and level that playing field. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those some of the things that I was really excited about that we were doing at CISTRA when, when I came in the door is that in 2020, they established a so social equity and justice task force that's staffed by or populated by staff. And, and they are doing is identifying programs that we can implement within our company to make us better, to make us more, um, a more diverse and inclusive workforce. So I was really proud of what they're doing and they're very aggressive about uh, establishing uh, internships within the company to uh, help bring in, develop that pipeline, feed that pipeline of future professionals in our organization. 
and then one of the things that I noticed that the data told me that jumps out is that we have um, we have 27% women in our in our workforce. I'd like to see that number be higher, right? But 27% is not bad when I look at the fact that most of these women are in non-female traditional careers, right? They're overhead catenary systems engineers. They're rail, rail uh, engineers. I mean, you know, that's not something you see on the playground every day when the little girls are jumping rope going, man, I want to be an OCS engineer, right? You know, so... The fact that we've got women doing this is powerful. And so I'm starting an internal uh, women's initiative to uh, part of, and part of the outcomes of that initiative is I want us to introduce more women to these non-traditional female roles in our industry. And uh, so I'm excited about that as a, as a new initiative of our company. Yeah, that's really exciting, introducing women to non-traditional female roles. And again, you know, going back, and it, it goes back to someone what uh, was said at the beginning about as we hire and, you know, and as, you know, CEOs hire, you know, thinking thinking outside of the box um, is, is incredibly, is incredibly important. Yeah, I, so, I think I would add to that to the so the pipeline issue i think we've sort of discussed which is you know one of the things i do think where we have to target is getting little girls talking and excited about stem and getting little girls talking about wanting to be ocs engineers on the playground so i think we have to also start there to bring the pipeline in um but one of the you know as we talk about the pipeline i think something that was slightly touched upon by denise and in her initial comments is also understanding that women rightly or wrongly within society bear the predominant burden of family re responsibilities even if they're the primary breadwinner they often are still oftentimes a primary caretaker whether it's for you know children whether it's for elderly uh, parents or family members and so they often have these other burdens and making sure that we have structures in place within our organization our industries that don't just promote allowing women to be able to continue their careers while they balance that, but also, and what we've seen has been successful, and one of the you know things that I've been encouraging, um, and predominantly in Europe, where in some countries they're they're actually requiring this, is actually encouraging men to not just have access to leave opportunities, but requiring them to take them and incentivizing them to take their leave opportunities as it relates to family responsibilities, because studies have shown that when men are also taking parental leave, it not only just it not only helps balance responsibilities and involvement and in terms of the households, but it actually helps advance all people's careers and it helps advance women's careers as well because they're not viewed negatively for, for utilizing that um, that time and not being penalized for, for doing so. So in, in some countries in Europe, they're requiring men to take parental leave, so a, a number of weeks of parental leave, which we're encouraging. And, and I've required um, certain of the men, especially some of the men who are in director positions, to have to take their parental leave. So as to set an example um, for the others that are in their departments. Um, but they're also and in Europe, which is something I think we should be considering more broadly. If if men or women take their parental leave in order to encourage it, those amounts are actually um, have tax exemption. So those amounts that they gain have and it incentivizes men to actually take those that time off as you know it's as a tax you know incentivized um, leave that they're able to take. So I, I just think doing that and it's because it is a means you know it's not just bringing women into the pipeline but it's also giving them the opportunity so that they can continue their careers but also um addressing some of those sort of external issues that are that are um that exist i think are also important marjorie i, I think what strikes me about this conversation is i'll use a transportation metaphor is in transportation we often talk a lot about what happens until you know the ribbon cutting <laughs> and then we forget that there's like a, a many, many decades of life cycle after that when you're talking about infrastructure and we think about diversity we often frame it in the same way that how do we get 
these candidates in the door. And I think one thing that's, that's, that I'd reflect on about this conversation is there's a lot of recommendations here that happen after you get that candidate in the door, which is so critical. Um, and to Nuria's point about trying to balance uh, a variety of priorities, ACOM has taken a lot of lessons learned from this COVID period. Um, and we know that there are some some frightening statistics out of COVID and the and the personal experiences that we I know all of us have with friends and family or ourselves who have have, have struggled to balance during this COVID period. At ACOM, we found that there are some rich lessons to be learned that we are then going to, to carry forward um, to be able to support um, our workforce and particularly um, to our workforce that needs needs help in balancing priorities, which is to Nuria's point, almost always disproportionately women. Strategies like um, setting up regional offices um, outside those core city locations so that as our employees look at a new ecosystem that includes our client site and a, a work site or an office in their home, and they're putting together that recipe that works for them and for their families and for their teams, um, that they have options that are closer to home where they want to come in to, to be present with their teams, or they can slip out in the middle of the afternoon. And to Marjorie, I think you made a comment about Little League or someone did, slip out and, and be able to get to that, that game and then get back and to be able to make that meeting with Asia that evening. And so we're trying to really look, knowing that during the COVID period, our, our colleagues did some extraordinary work. Uh, there's a, uh, road a road project in Texas where we had 500 kitchen tables across four continents working on a, a single job during the COVID period. And it worked very, very well um, and got a great product for our, our customer and our community. So we know we can be efficient. We know we can utilize technology to be able to keep our teams together. So how do we take these lessons learned from COVID to rethink the next generation of workforce and our work environment so that we maximize our spaces, create that flexibility and provide support for not just our female colleagues, but all of our colleagues to be able to have a more manageable and workable um, environment um, and to be able to be successful and have a sustainable career over the long term. Uh, incredibly valuable point. And well, it's amazing. We've already, we've only got 15 minutes left. And uh, so I wanna ask, um, you know, a leadership question, you know, women, women leaders and professionals, and all of you have hit on this, still face unique barriers and biases, whether intentional or unintentional in the workplace. And in many ways, and it's surprising to many people, these challenges only increase as we advance in our careers. And um, from your perspective, what are the different expectations of women managers and leaders? And how have these manifested themselves in your career? And what advice would you give to other women about handling these situations and you know, capitalizing on uh, our strengths in the workplace? Roger, I have a horrible story and I, I just hate it every time I tell it, but I think it's a, a lesson learned. We spend a lot of time talking to women about um, and, and coaching and helping each other to, to deal with circumstances like microaggressions and, and, and um, sp people speaking over women in, the, in meetings and those kinds of things. And all that's very, very important discussion. But I had a pretty serious lesson learned once when I was negotiating and trying to advance a multi-billion dollar transportation project. And I was having, or you'll be shocked, a challenge with one of my contractors. Um, and <laughs> and um, so I, I talked to him about, I'm getting some pressure on the price of this job. And you know, he was reassured, it was like nine o'clock at night, I was on the phone, he was reassuring me, no, it's fine, the price is not going to go up, it's perfectly fine, everything is okay. And I woke up the next morning and by 8 a.m. the price had gone up $200 million. I'm on the what? And so I get on the phone and I call him and I'm like, well, I use some words that I won't use for this, you know, webinar. And he and I said, what is going on? He said, well, I just, I just did not want to hurt your feelings. Um, and he, <laughs> true story. And he had admitted to me earlier in the job that he had never worked with a woman in a decision making role. And he was very far along in his career. And the women that he had worked with had been in administrative positions. And he, 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 he'd never worked with a woman in a decision-making role, so he awkwardly stepped through it. And he didn't want to hurt my feelings to tell me the price had gone up $200 million. So it was just going to wait till I got the paper the next day and found out myself. So 
And, and the lesson I take from that, it's just a horrible story, but the lesson I take from that is there are things that we talk, we, that we talk a lot about as women and support each other, it, it more and more so as we get farther in our career, which is great. But there are also things that you need to be conscious of as a women leader. We are dealing with some very high stakes, complicated, serious stuff. And you need to have your, your antenna up because people are on different parts of their journey on this issue. And you need to be smart about the lens at which the people that you're working with who maybe not are not not have not woken up to the to the absolute critical nature of diversity to competitiveness in this world. And they may be looking at things through different lenses. You got to you got to be have your antenna up to that so that you can be smart in your negotiations and you can keep an eye out for those kinds of, of biases, because that's different than making comments about your hair or right. or talking over you in a meeting. All those things are things we have to deal with every day as women. Um, but but there are things that are a different uh, angle of that that you have to have your intent up for and be prepared for as well. And know that this person is working with you. They may approach it in a different way than if they were approaching, you know, a, um, uh, uh, the more traditional uh, gender and, and uh, appearance of the people that they tend to be negotiating with. Yeah. yeah, and I, I that think, goes to, to say that goes really, you know, to many of the questions that I'm seeing come through. So I think let's let's kind of continue on this. Um, Kimberly, why don't why don't you jump in? I know you'll. Yeah, I was just thinking that one of the things we talked about previously is that people expect women to be nicer than men. They yes. expect us to, to lead with a, a more gentle and caring hand. Uh, and, and you know, I'm a mom. I have two kids. You can ask my daughters. I've got a gentle and caring hand until I don't, right? Uh, so <laughs> until something else exactly. is needed. Uh, so, but it's, you know, it's that expectation that uh, that we are going to be just so much nicer in how we do it. And, and yes, maybe that is part of what we bring to the table about having a broader view, view about being more compassionate, about being, hopefully being good listeners. And, and I don't think that's tied to my gender. I think that's tied to who I am as an individual, right? Uh, and, but the problem comes in is that you can see with that mentality that's out there, that a man can sometimes say the same thing that I would have said, and it is perceived as being, oh, well, he was good and direct with me. I got good guidance, and that was wonderful, right? But if, if I, as a woman, say it, then it's, oh, well, God, well, she really was aggressive, and, and made probably other few words that, you know, that's in that same category that Jennifer, you know, was talking about earlier that I can't share on the webinar, but it, they... <laughs> But, you know, or she's difficult to deal with, you know, she uh, she's just too, too much of a driver. Uh, but and if, when when a man is identified as a driver, that is, is seen as the epitome of excellence. Right. That is that is a true leader and the kind of person we, we want to have. So we're always caught between between that scenario of uh, being being trying to be seen as being compassionate and nice uh and but then also being forceful when you need to be forceful and having people not lose their minds to think that something's wrong with you because you then said something harsh to them but i i said i i'll tell this one quick story that early Please. on in my career and i i said i don't do this anymore but i i in my 20s actually because my background is actually in computer programming to some degree and I worked with travel demand forecasters and every, I began to manage this team and everyone on the team were all men except for me and they were all much older than I was, right? And so, um, and, and so that was something that was tricky to navigate. And I got into this habit though of when I was telling them something or had something to communicate, I would leave post-it notes in their chair, being, you know, trying and, and, and little nice notes for them and stuff. Yes, I know it was overboard, but right. But they loved it apparently. And so one time, uh, a gentleman that was working for me, I, I sent him an email or something to direct what, you know, what he needed to do next. And I didn't go and leave the post-it note. And he was so upset and he went actually to uh, the person above me, the director above me, and complained that I didn't like him, that I was not 
you know, I was not talking. We got down to it. It was he was upset because I didn't leave a post-it note that day, that one time with a nice note on it. And I was like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? You know, but so I don't do post-it notes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that expectation, you know? Yeah, and, and you make such a great point about that because I'm seeing in the questions things coming in as you were speaking about, you know, the different expectations of women versus male leaders. We got an amen and completely agree and every other word that could, you know, mean mean that same thing. So we're obviously hitting a note here that many in the audience uh, are very interested in have experienced and as you know as as we all have you know risen in the ranks you know you face it, it is unexpected i always thought you know it would get easier as you moved up but yeah. that's not the, it, it's not the case it's um it's it's the opposite if you're you know because you're expected to solve problems and be direct and be assertive and that's why you got there but then when you're direct and you're assertive and you uh you know it, some people can't handle it and it's 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 like you said a male could say the same thing in the room and even be more direct or be more you know but you know we we are always in our heads trying to balance you know uh how you know how do we how do we balance this and then there's a certain point where you can't you know you want to but work has to get done and we're and you know you're sometimes you you made the point right you have kids and we're expect you know expected to be you can't be the mother at work as well um, even right. though there's a part of us, right, that instinctually wants to be, you know, we want to coddle to some extent and we want to, you know, and we want to help people. It's naturally in us. But can you, can uh, Denise, Nuria, Jennifer, do you want to pick up uh, on you know, some of that? One thing I will speak to is recognizing all of what we're saying. I think it's even more important for women in the workplace and for young people that are coming in and people of, uh, of just a diverse backgrounds, et cetera, um, is to be strategic about their circumstance. So um, just an example in terms of being, um, you know, the other guy getting credit for what you're, the point you're trying to make or being paid attention to. I've picked up the strategy of finding validators and before going into a meeting and saying, okay, look, this is what I think is important. So I'm going to bring up this point. Are you on board with me? Can you Second, second it when I bring up this point, right? And just sort of understanding where you sit, right? We all have this role that we play when we're at a table um, and understanding that role, good or bad, pluses and minuses, and then being strategic about how you balance that, I do think is very important. As Jennifer was saying, um, being aware and having your antenna up, absolutely know those things and then understand how to play them uh, to your strengths, right? And understanding where your where your um, opportunities come from and where your strengths come from. I, I just, I, that's just one thing, you know, I've had experiences, everything from, you know, I remember when I was pregnant, being told that I was unlikely to come back to work. And so as a result, it, there was just all sorts of assumptions and decisions made and um and even to the point i had this one experience i will never forget where i had an individual who we needed to separate from he needed to separate from the organization and he said to me at the time was i was working with him to sort of strategize on how he makes a good exit and and, and does it in a way that makes sense for him and, and the organization and his response was well i don't think you really mean what you're saying um, so I'm gonna come back. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just like this crazy concept that we <laughs> deal with of people really underestimating who we are because of all of these other external faces that they add to it. So understanding that and then playing to the strengths of whatever that means for the moment, I really think is really important. People have to be strategic and think about the circumstances they're going into. I I'm gonna where you're sitting at the table point and with with two sort of anecdotes because um when i took on the role of ceo and as as i think all the women on this panel recognized our you know our counterparts um in our industry typically are you know white men in their 60s 
And so, you know, we're often the either, you know, often usually the only women in the room and often, you know, younger than a lot of our counterparts. And what happened, especially when I initially took over the role, is I would go to meetings, particularly with my COO or, you know, my VP of business development. And the people at the meeting would turn and they'd be talking to my, like literally physically, their body was turned and they were talking to the other men when I'm the one who's making the decisions. And so it was, it became a little bit frustrating. I was frustrated internally, especially at the beginning, um, which, you know, to me was all complicated with this, oh my gosh, you know, this, am I really ready for this role? Look, it's, you know, this isn't working. And to the credit actually of one of the men who worked for me, he's like, we can't allow this to happen. And he was so upset by it that he came up with an idea, which was literally placing me in a specific strategic part at the table so that when, and it was completely orchestrated and somewhat ridiculous performance, but when there were meetings that were happening that we wanted to make sure that it was pretty clear who was gonna be making the decisions, I would show up at a little bit later to the meeting, sit at the center of the table, and it was very clear where I was sitting. And you know, my people would turn specifically to like their body language to look at me. So it was very clear that's the person you're supposed to talk to. <laughs> um, and sort of to Jennifer's point, where it was like they weren't used to they they and they you know they just weren't used to that yet. And so um, you know, I think at the you know it was completely performative it was a little bit outrageous and ridiculous but it was effective and it was you know symbolic in a way it doesn't happen anymore people are pretty pretty much know who i am when i walk into a room um but i would say that's one of the things that sitting at the table and the other one that i think impacts women sort of along the career path and especially when you end up being going higher up and you're one of the only women is oftentimes when notes need to be taken, everybody just looks at you in the room. And they're like, oh, you're the lady, so you're gonna take the notes at the meeting. So um, to build to the strengths aspect, I think it's pretty powerful actually to be the note taker. So I would say, um, as long as it's not taking away from your ability to be able to participate actively in a meeting, but being the person who takes notes at a meeting and then circulates the, minutes or the task and you can assign yourself tasks from that meeting say you know what this needs to get done so i'm going to handle that you know i'm going to take the lead on that and you've now circulated it and you've been able to take responsibility it gives i think um it gives exposure to to you and and the last thing i'll say about sort of advice and i think it's been said on this panel it you know as it relates to women and particularly people who are in leadership positions but also to Denise's point about having validators, I think it's very important to really give the proper attribution to the people who brought up an idea mm -hmm. and sort of repeat it um, and encourage people at a meeting that if they're if they're going to say something, always try and you know bring it back. Well, as the last person who spoke, making sure that it's always you're always building off of what someone else said. And and my last sort of thing as it relates to be sitting at the table. I'm like thinking of so many examples of that literally sitting at a table. So um, a lot of times women, younger people who are, it's their first time at a meeting, they're so nervous about actually speaking up that they preface what they're going to say with a negative and they downplay what they're about to say. And I always try and tell, like I try and discourage that language in general. So not saying, oh, this is a bad idea or this might be, this might not work or like don't preface what you're gonna say in a negative way. Just say what you're gonna say. Or if you don't, if you're not fully sure, I think there's more positive ways. So one of the ones that, you know, um, talking with some friends of mine that we all were kind of comparing. And one of the ones that I thought was really good is like just brainstorming and you put your idea out so it's like just brainstorming but it's not it's like hey this i'm trying to bring a, a positive contribution to this meeting um here's my idea without down without putting down your idea before you've actually said it so i think in terms of people as they're you know working their way up and in these meetings where so much happens um and as 
parts of your career and the exposure that you get to people in leadership, um, I think it's you know some of the tips that I learned along the way. And Marjorie, I think one of the common themes listening to this and my colleagues here is if the advice I think we give to the hundreds of people on the, the call is don't let this daily interaction stuff upset you and get you down or discourage you. It's okay to be strategic. You know, Denise should not have to arrange ahead of time to have someone back a meeting and Nuria shouldn't have to sit exactly. in another chair. And you could just be home and be mad about that or you could just be strategic and get the get the job done, right? And I think it's okay to be deliberate and strategic about it because and not let yourself just wallow in. If someone had told any of us when we were 25 that we'd still be dealing with this now, you know, we would have probably put <laughs> turn our hands up then and said, I'm not doing this. But, but it's okay to be strategic. Don't let it get you down. And I think the biggest lesson I've learned is find women in your lives that that you can talk through this stuff with. And I have some of them here on this video with with when it does get to you and it will continue to get to you and that doesn't stop there's no milestone that i've hit yet where that stops make sure you have someone that you can call and say i'm dealing with this and and to vent and just and to know that they are dealing with the same thing and to share tips and best practices i think early in my career women didn't you know women older than me they didn't i didn't get that sort of support and i think we do a much better job now um, of really rallying around each other and helping each other through this and, and support. So find your find your peeps and, and get on the phone and be frustrated and share those horrible mm -hmm. stories, but then go back to work and, and show them your stuff. That, that, that's, that's a wonderful way to uh, close this. And I think, you know, that goes to two points. Like, you know, it's kind of your personal board of directors and, you know, in, you know, I'll share with the audience and we're a little over. So I, I think we could go to women at the helm 2.0. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, having people that, you know, in the in the prep chef tradition, I'll share this with the audience. Um, it, it was just it was an amazing prep session because we sat together and it was someone had said earlier, our stories are so similar. We all do somewhat different things, but the experiences that we've gone through and we continue to go through today are all very similar and being able to talk about that with each other. And I think we, to your point, Jennifer, we do a much better job of that today, but it is so important to be able to uh, talk to others about that. And then, uh, you know, and, and, and then and I even have, you know, a male mentor that I can, you know, talk to about this. Um, and, um, as I was, you know, as I was coming up. So, and it's also goes to, and one very last important point I want to point out is uh, a couple of the questions that we got from the audience uh, went right to this point, which was, you know, as women historically, we haven't done the best job of uh, supporting other women. And I think that's getting better, but you know, I think, you know, what we heard today from our panelists are strategies that we can help each other, um, you know, make it a point to if, uh, you know, a, if you hear a woman say something at a meeting um, and then a man says it later or, you know, anyone says it later that you say, oh, thank you, so-and-so. I think that was a wonderful idea, Sally. Uh, Michael. Um, it sounds like you had something to add to that. So, you know, let's do that for each other. And um, I know we all on this call try to do that. And I think that's a wonderful strategy for uh, women coming up as as well as the just brainstorming uh, instead of, uh, you know, self-deprecation prior to uh, what could be a very valuable insight. So. Um, thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, like I said, I think we could go with Women at the Helm 2.0. Um, and some helpful, just some final helpful notes from Eno. You can find a recording of today's webinar on Eno's website, enotrans.org. 
The recording will also be emailed to all registrants within a day. And be sure to sign up for Eno's uh, mailing list to gain access to its amazing Eno Connector newsletter, webinar announcements, report releases, and more. Um, Eno is very happy to offer this complimentary webinar series. If you enjoy the webinars and are interested in supporting Eno's work, you can check out the link in the chat box. Uh, to donate or become a member, and I highly encourage our, our audience to do so. Finally, a huge thank you to my friends Jennifer, Denise, Kimberly, and Nuria for joining me today for this terrific and insightful conversation, and to our audience uh, for your participation and your questions, which I tried to weave in as uh, we were going through the panel. Thank you, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.